It's June 1st, 2016. I'm Sue Cohen with the San Marcos Heritage Association and we're very privileged today to be able to visit with Vernon and Dolores McDonald. And Dolores came here first. She got here in 1948 and Vernon got here as quick as he could uh, in 1949. Dolores, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be in San Marcos? I came here that fall, not a bism, born in San Marcos, but I've been here a long time. And I came here that fall to attend South, uh, Southwest Texas State Teachers College and I moved into Sally Beretta dorm that was the newest dorm on campus it, it had opened there January before 1948 it opened that January can I raise the question oh Sally Beretta had lots of rules we couldn't go outside we couldn't be out after nine o'clock at night on weeknights and on a, a Saturday night, we could stay up to 12. A Friday night, I think it was 11.30. We couldn't wear shorts or pants or blue jeans outside the dorm. Across the hall, across the, uh, the road, can I do that? You're I doing do that? great. You can do whatever you're comfortable. Okay. Across the street from Sally Beretta were two two-story white frame buildings. One was the Bandon House for the college and the high school. The other was the Ray House, W-R-A-Y House. I, I guess it was named after the people that had lived there. It was a girls' dormitory. Then across the street and up the hill was the Catholic Church. And across from the Catholic Church was a white frame building that was the college infirmary. And Dr. William Moore and Dr. Haley were the doctors there. Then across the street toward Evans Auditorium there was Harris Hall, the boys' dorm, and up above that were two dorms. One was a co-op dorm where the girls cooked their own meals and served them. Everybody else except them and the athletes ate in the cafeteria, which was below the student union building, the old student building up on the quad. Do you remember how many students there were when you came? About 1,100. There were no cars just about. There was one boy and his sister had a, shared a car and there were some veterans that had come back from World War II on the GI Bill getting their education. They, they probably had cars but I, I did they weren't around campus much so we didn't see them. Um, next to Sally Beretta was a little wooden shack looking building where Roland and Ruth Mansky opened their Manskys, their first Manskys and made their Mansky rolls, their famous Mansky rolls there. I, the kids hung out in there. They had some pinball machines, I think, didn't they? Yeah. But I didn't go in there much, but a lot of the veterans did and the, and the older students. We had to furnish our own meals on Sunday night. So we'd all troop downtown to eat the night Sunday night meal and go to the Palace Theater that was on the corner of LBJ and Hutchinson Street. Just a minute, I gotta think. <laughs> You're doing great. San Marcos didn't have any public schools at that time. The, the students were on campus. The elementary students were in the Evans Auditorium building, and the high school and junior high school was across the LBJ in the science building. We had to do some observations after we were majoring in education, and most, most people that went to Southwest Texas then were majoring in education. Some of the students that I remember being there were Jimmy Scott and Ross King and the Nix girls, Sue and Sandra Nix. Do uh, you remember anybody? I think uh, Billy Knispel's daughter went to school there about that time. There were a lot of girls that went to school there and came on up to Southwest Texas, but I, I didn't know them while they were in high school. On, on down the uh, from Beretta toward town, there were some white buildings, uh, homes, two-story homes, and one of them was the house in which Lyndon Johnson lived, which they later moved to the corner. But at that time, on that corner was Roster's Cafe. Ms. Roster was Red Jerica's mother, I think. Then across the street from Rossler's, they had started an old building 
but a building, to build a building, but they hadn't finished it. They just had some pipes or things out there, weren't there? Mm -hmm. And in that little place was a Coney Island stand mm -hmm. that sold six Coney Islands for a dollar. So we enjoyed that. <laughs> then on down that block, at the end of the block was the Palace Theater, and next to it was, I think, a little bitty a build, a store, it was Simon's Bakery. Where did you come from? Where I did came you... from Baytown, Texas, down near Houston. Then across the street, in the next block, was a pharmacy, and all, there were I think there were four pharmacies in town at that time around the square. They all had uh, soda fountains, where and that caused the students, high school and college, to get uh, gather in there, you know, and drink cokes and things. Jug Eight Air had a restaurant down there, uh, and in in a little opening between buildings were some stairs that led up to Pennington's funeral home, where. Willard, uh, Willard Pennington and Idra. Idra were living. Then in the next block around the square, they you want me to talk about the square, don't you? Not necessarily. That, your memory's incredible. Go ahead. <laughs> not, re not really. It's really not. <laughs> oh, well, it, I want to hear how, okay, how did you meet this one that you've been married to for 65 years? What brought you to San Marcos, Vernon? Coach Jowers, and I got a scholarship. You came from where? I went to junior college. T Texas Lutheran College was a junior college at that time. And I went there two years, and then Coach Jowers wanted me to come over here and play for him, which I did. And Football? Basketball. Basketball. Yes. Basketball, yes, ma'am. Basketball only. I came here in 1949, and we I, I have down here, we had less than 1,500 students, which is probably right. Old Main and the quad was the center of our university. Omaine had all the important things in it. Omaine had the president's office, it had the registrar's office, it had the men's and women dean's office. Downstairs was a coffee shop. Upstairs was classroom where they had history, speech, drama class, and a little theater. All in Omaine. It's, now we got 25 buildings that have the same thing, but that's not them. <laughs> Let's talk about the gymnasium where I was interested. Well, our gymnasium was very small, held about 500 people. And when we played a ball game, it filled up very quickly with our students and with Buda and Kyle people. They came over a, a whole lot. And since it was so small that the game would start and the people outside couldn't get, even get in because it was too small, the people up the top would push the windows up and they say the score is 28 to 25, and they'd holler outside so they didn't know what the score was outside. That's the only way they didn't know anything about it. So that's how we kept scored during the ball game. Uh, we had two gyms. We had a gym, I mean, two gym floors. We had a gym floor that we played on and practiced on. Downstairs, we let the high school practice on the gym downstairs. Uh, we had two athletic dorms for, for the athletes. One of his fancy names, Bobcat One and Bobcat Two. <laughs> Bobcat One had the basketball players. Bobcat Two had the football players. And I, I was in Bobcat One, and, I, and Coach Jarvis wasn't married at that time, and so he had a room in Bobcat One, and my room was right next to his in Bobcat One. But you think that wasn't gentle and nice? I didn't know I would come over and live by the coach, but you know I did. He kept a close eye on you. Yes. Did he need to? No. <laughs> if we made too much noise, he'd throw a shoe against the wall or against the ceiling. Uh -huh. there. Boom, I'd say, oh my word, he threw a shoe at us. Uh, we had our own cafeteria, uh, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Miss Treat was our dietitian, and Irene was our cook. And we had two long tables, chairs on each side. And when it was time to eat, We'd all get our plates and we'd go get in line and Irene would put food on our plates. I guess like you're doing the military, I mean like in prison, <laughs> which we thought it was, and we'd go back and eat our delicious food. And it was really good, except on Sunday night we had to get our own food like, like the girls did. They didn't, I don't know why nobody, they didn't want to feed us on Sunday night. I don't know. 1951, 52. 
we were really, really good. We won 30 games and lost one. And we went to the national tournament in Kansas City. And a lot of the, a lot of the people went to Kansas City. A lot of the students and a lot of the town people did too. But they, were, they broadcast live in Evans Auditorium. And the students that couldn't go, which were most of them, were, were in Evans Auditorium to hear, the, hear about the game. Well, we won a game or two, and after we won a game, they had to take up a collection to try to get them to broadcast the next one. They didn't have anybody to pay for it. So they, they'd run pads and hat during the game so they could broadcast the next game. That's right. And we had a guy here named Mr. Clyde. He decided he was going to take a car of kids up there to see the championship game, for the fifth round. Well, he got there, we had already gotten beat, so he, just, he saw us play for the third place instead of playing for the championship, but he, at least he came up there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sure was. Uh, a guy named Buck Payne came up there. He was a had a he had a cleaning shop here. Barton Gill was my barber. Everybody else was barber. Herman Carf. They were all. They went to Kansas City. Carf had a plane. They flew over. They were there all week. And that's when Mr. Clyde got there for the championship game, and we weren't there. After it's over with, I came back. Texas and went to Eagle Pass as the basketball coach one year. Well, wait a minute. Hold up. When did you meet Dolores? Too soon. Where did y'all <laughs> meet? Under the old apple tree. Oh, no, I was going to say that. Uh, y'all meet here in San Marcos? Yes. 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 At the yes. university. I at saw the her a lot quicker than she saw me. That's right. She was with the football players, and I was mad at her and the football player. But, oh, but I beat them out. Didn't I? Yeah, I guess what so. year was that? Nineteen fifty. When did we get married? Fifty one. Fifty one. We started to be dating. So you were still in college. He was yes. still in college. We were both juniors. Juniors in college. And your parents were okay with that? You don't know that. Can I tell them the rest of it? I don't guess so. You're telling everything. She took her roommate. I took my roommate. Went over to New Rome. Got married. You eloped. We eloped. Is that yes. what you call it? Yeah, I think so. Coach Jarrett wouldn't let us let our players be married. So we got married, and I didn't know what to do, and we waited about 30 seconds. I said, i got to see Coach Jarrett, because if I don't have a scholarship, I can't. I, this is not part of the story. And, oh, yeah, it is part of the story. <laughs> so I said, i got to talk to Coach Jarrett. If, he's, if he says, no way, no, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because you were already married. I'm already married, that's right. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course, she stayed in her dorm and I stayed in mine. Oh, it was really high-class high, high class stuff. <laughs> so I went down to see Coach Jowers. Ooh, and my heart, were you nervous? Do you know Coach Jowers? No, but I've heard about him. He's the baddest dude in town. And I tell you, he, I love the old story rascal. Anyway, I went in and I said, Coach Jowers, I need to talk to you. He said, what about? I said, Dolores and me are thinking about getting married. And, and, and he looked at me and he says, are you in trouble? <laughs> wow. And I said, I didn't know he was going to tell how of <laughs> Go on. I, I, the Lord is my time. It's fresh at all. Uh, and I said, No, sir, I wish you're not. And he said, Well, when are you thinking about getting married to that little red headed girl? And I said, About two weeks ago. He said, My Lord, help us. I said, Coach, what, do I have my scholarship? He said, I got to think about it. I said, I can't take it. Do I have my scholarship or not? And he says, well, let me think about it. I said, no, sir. Now or never. And he laughed. He said, yeah, you got your scholarship. Whew. I was certainly happy. Now wow. I shouldn't have told all that. No, that's great. And so then did you live together, or did you wait till you graduated? We moved into a boarding house, the Penn Hotel. Fred, you ever hear the Penn Hotel? I remember that. that it was just a story. Where was it? I think it was where the little H E B is now. Right now, that's where it was. Along in there somewhere. We could eat and stay there and everything for about fifty cents a month. No, we had to be we needed to stay there about a month and it was about two hundred dollars I think. For we ate our meals there too. Yes, yes. And you had a room? We yes. had a I had a room. And a bathroom? Yes. Then not a private bath, we shared a bath. We thought it was first class because we were married. <laughs> And so then you graduated, and you went, y'all went together as a couple. We did. To Eagle Pass, you said? Eagle. 
just one year. We stayed there nine months. It was hot as H-E-L-L, and my wife says, you got to get you a job or a wife. And what was your job there? I was a basketball coach, okay. high school basketball coach, one year. And, and it was hot. You guys were young. Oh, young and hot. Oh, it was hot. And I said, what am I going to do? I can't just go off and get, say I've got a job. The phone rang one day. I picked up the phone. It was Coach Jowers. He said, you want to come up here? And I was up here before he hung up. <laughs> I said, let me think about it. No, I was there. He said, you want to be my assistant? I said, I sure do. So we moved to San Marcos. And you've been here ever since? Ever since. i got to tell you the rest of that story. Okay. I coached with Coach Jowers. Coach, he was the greatest coach in the world. Boy, that guy was a dude. Uh, after about... I believe eight or nine years. One day he came into my office, and he, which was right next to his, and he says, "Do you want to be the basketball coach at Southwest Texas?" And I said, "Yes, sir." And he took his keys and threw them on my desk. He said, "You're the coach." That was no no search committee, <laughs> no search, no nothing. That's no. pretty different than today. I guarantee you, he said, "You're the coach." And how long were you the head coach? For about fifteen years. And then eight or nine years as the assistant. That's right. So like twenty. All together, probably or seem like a hundred, but we we made it. It uh, it, it was a, a great experience. My wife she should have quit me a bunch of times, but coaching is a terrible job for your family. Because <clears throat> well, you admit it, not your job comes first. You know, you got a game. I can't say well, I ain't going to that game, which I thought about doing a bunch of times, but I couldn't do it. And where did y'all live when you moved back? from Eagle Pass. Ma'am, ma'am, I shouldn't tell you. We lived at Dog Patch. <laughs> these, these. This was down where the Strand Coliseum is now. It was old barracks. I've heard about it. Oh, Have my you, word. That they converted into yes. a, apartments for married students. And you could, if they sneeze or cough, you could hear that everybody through the wall. It was just, it was just a piece well, of paper. And it was called Dog Patch? Well, that's what you called it. That's what, we called. that's what some of the, the students called it. We I called it Riverside. See, that's nice. <laughs> I heard it was pretty uh, meager. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, while we were there, we wanted to watch TV, and, and one, one guy had a TV set. And on, I believe, Wednesday night, they had wrestling or boxing or somewhere, and he would open the door to his apartment and put his TV there, and everybody had to sit on a grass bowl and watch that TV. And that was big time. And remember over there, that was first class. And we didn't have to pay for it because we didn't have any money. You didn't have air conditioning, I guess? Air conditioning? <laughs> no. No. We didn't even have a fan. <laughs> it, I, I'm sorry, I ruined the whole No, program. this is great. I got more to say, but you Keep want to talking. say it? I want you to say it. I want, I want to say a few things about when I came back here to work. Please. Who, who the big wheels are. Dr. Flower, John Fry was the president. Dean, no, he was the dean. Dr. Derrick was something, he was a big shot. And I mentioned Prof. Green taught history. The reason I'm bringing Prof. Green up, Lyndon Johnson loved him. And he loved Lyndon Johnson. When, when President Johnson came back to see him, he, he always wanted to see Prof. Green. <coughs> Coach Strand was our track coach and athletic director. He's one, and he started sports at Southwest Texas in, in 1918. Coach Strand did. Okay. Uh, coach Jarrett was a basketball coach and assistant football coach. Coach Vest was our football coach. And Chico Ginsburg was a tennis coach, and then he helped coach a little bit of everything. He's a San Marcos boy, by the way. A lot of those men have buildings named after him today. Yeah, they do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On the campus. The square was just like it is today, except the businesses were all different. We had a courthouse and everything around just like it was. And here's some stories. I mean, stories she already told you about. Them. No, I didn't tell them. I haven't told them. Tell about go, Jimmy's go, you no. Horse no. Man had a clothing store. Jack Hughes had the Chevrolet come down on the corner. And then there was a Miller's Drug, a Rosser's Cafe. Frontier Shops sold so Western clothes, J.C. Penney, and Carson's on the Circle. The 81 used to come through here to go to San Antonio. It was not 35, but 81. And when it'd get down here and you want to go to Seguin, you'd take a left on to go uh, 181 cross 123. 
they had a roundabout there. You couldn't eat in a roundabout. That's like, and and Carson's on the Circle Restaurant had a restaurant right there on it. It was a good good restaurant. It's also a truck stop and everything, but it was a good restaurant. And one of the best restaurants in town was a Mexican restaurant called Paul Richard. Paul Guerrero owned it. And I meant to bring my umbrella in there. They gave me an umbrella one time, and I still have the darn the girl. thing. He had three girls, that daughters that worked out there, real pretty girls yeah. that worked out there. They all liked me. <laughs> uh, they that. gave me an umbrella one time in the shape of a uh, hat. A cap. To, take to, to wear, I'm a cap to wear at a baseball game. Big old umbrella. Cute. I still got that. A hundred years old. Can I talk some more? Cause Please. I talk too much. No. I was starving to death. They paid me fifty cents a month. I didn't make anything. My wife's mad. As I, an I, assistant coach? Oh yeah. Oh yes, ma'am. You didn't make nothing. No, that was just a lie. But I didn't make much more than fifty cents. And so I ran the city swimming pool. In your spare time? In the summertime. And now, ma'am, you call that a swimming pool because the San Marcos River went floating right down that river. We put a cable over here, and they put a cable over here, and now I ran that swimming pool. Now you know where our pool was. That's exactly right. If you got over that cable, you're in the pool. If you're on the other side, you're in the river. It's all the same difference. All right? But there were lifeguards, I guess, at That's the right. pool. That's right. I was the head honcho, and we had lifeguards all the time. Nobody, I did it for years, and no one ever drowned. No, and I don't know why. Was that, where was that? Was it up by the university or down where Rio Vista is? Right. Do you know where the, where's that building there, George? It's a little boy, a little boy scout building. It's a, oh, a little yeah, boy scout, yeah. but that was the bathhouse. For the swimming area. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've never, nobody's ever talked about that. <coughs> and people didn't have to pay to swim there. They just, no, they, not unless I caught them. Yes, ma'am. You can't oh, you get had in. to pay? Oh, we had it marked off, but cables, they couldn't get in there. How much did it cost? 25 cents. And <laughs> that's right. Uh, I ran a swimming pool, went to the river, and I had to go get, I had to go, go see the recreation committee. I had to go see Patty Sullivan and Helen Van Gundy. You ever hear those two ladies? Oh, yeah. They wanted to hire me to work and I, uh, for every year because nobody else would do it. And I taught a lot of kids. I taught, I taught uh, Greg, Linda Field, Linda Greg Field. She, now she owns her the world. You the taught family, her how to swim? Yes, I did. I taught the family of, of Bess and Wilbur Hobson. And I have down here, I also taught the, the pizza lady. Do you have any idea who that is? Her name is Shalone. It's a black lady who is, she sells pizza for H-E-B and everybody calls her the pizza lady. I saw her today and I said, what is your name? And she says, Shalone Jackson. She said, you tell them I'm the little girl you taught how to swim with piggy tails. I said, yes ma'am, I'll tell them. That's exactly what she told me, so I've told you. That's right. We're how, good. how many years did you do that this, in the summers? Well, I'm still doing it. Oh, no. <laughs> he lies a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, got, I, I didn't make much money, ma'am. I mean, I got you were paid. still living in the barracks then, and you walked over there to work? Yeah, I guess so. We had a car then. You had it. Maybe you made me I walk. don't know. I don't know. You had a car. Oh, yeah, ma'am. <laughs> it's second hand, but it's a car. We, to, for the kids to go swimming, if they change their clothes, we had baskets for them to put their clothes in. I had some real pretty high school girls with, that would, were my basket girls, and that made the boys come. I had girls called Joanne West, very beauty. Bagley, Joanne Bag, West. Well, Bagley, yeah, Mary, Jim, Mary Roddy. Keita Hyatt, Flo Van Gundy, and Caroline Gent. They were all little 15, 16, 17, and the boys just fall. And I, quarter, I made a quarter out of one of those boys, and I loved those little girls. <laughs> That was on the, you were across the river then. Is that they, right? moved, they, moved, they built a recreation building in the swimming pool, made it the entrance to the swimming pool across the river. But that was a city pool. Yes, oh, that yeah, was a city a pool. pool. Oh, yeah, so we had you worked for the cities then. Yes, city right. Then. And we had two cables. We had a pool with cables. I never heard that. Well, thank goodness. How did people get in and out? Were there steps? They just jumped off the bank. 
What are you talking about? Just two cables. That it was, was a diving board there. It was a diving board. It was a diving board there. We had a boy named Cato Sanders that come there and he'd do a flip and land in the river and his head never going to water. Water was just about yay deep and we'd pay him 25 cents to go do that. Yeah, oh no, oh no. That's right. Uh, are you ready for more? Uh, in 1965, I was I was told or asked would I take my basketball team to, to Washington D.C. to let them see the president who graduated from, graduated from Southwest Texas, which I did. And that would be Lyndon Johnson. That's Lyndon Johnson. And which one are you in the picture? I'm. Let me why here I am right. Where am I? Right there. That's me right there in the middle. And that's Dolores in the that's white Dolores, coat? Yes. And our two, two and sons our two went with us. Yes. And Bill Overall was on the team. Here's Bill Overall. Here's San Marcos Boy who played for me. I don't know if we can get that or not, but I thought you might. That's pretty neat. I know I'm talking too much. I don't think no, it's, you're doing, keep on. Keep I'm it coming. Keep it coming, Vernon. I'm going to tell you a story. We got went in there and all my players had cameras, and we went into the, the White House. That was a, that was where the was his, his mem, the committee met, 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 and we were taking pictures of the, everything. The, the kids were just snapping everything, just cameras on the floor, and, and this guy said, "You can't take individual pictures here. You put those under your chair." And so everybody, me and everybody, put our cameras under our chair. And here comes the man. Mr. Johnson opened that door. He opened a big old box. He had ears about like this. He said, hello, Bobcats. I, I jumped up. I went over and shook that dude's head. He said, why are your cameras under the chair? And I very brilliantly said, your security people said we couldn't take pictures. He said, get the damn things and take all the pictures you want to. These guys are from my hometown. They weren't taking pictures of the security people. They took pictures of everybody in sight because the man said we could take pictures. And we did. That's right. That's a true story, too. Then I do it. I'm going to tell one more story about Lennon Johnson. Good. I didn't bring it, darn thing. What? My, 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 my Your pen? Yeah. Here they they signed the education bill. They signed the education bill in my gym, Lennon Johnson. I've seen pictures of that. It was rainy, it was muddy, it was terrible. And I was sick because my floor was just, it was awful. It'll never be clean. Nobody cared. <laughs> they got through and left, and I was standing by the door, to the back door to the thing, and a security man says, Coach, have they ruined your floor? And I said, they ruined my floor. And he said, I'll make you feel better. He went out to the desk that Lyndon Johnson signed it on, and he brought this back and gave it to me. <laughs> That's one of the fountain pens that he signed the thing with. It. You know, he signed L-Y-N-D and Lyndon Johnson. And I did. I felt a whole lot better. Was the floor ruined? No, heck no. I just cleaned it up. Yeah, I just cleaned it up. It's all okay. But, but I thought that was pretty good that I got one of those things. More stories. So, Dolores, when were your children born? And Vernon's too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they were his too. The sorry. older I'm boy, sorry. our older boy, was born in uh, Eagle Pass in 1952. Then our second son was born here in the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hospital in 1954. Donnie was born, the older boy was born in 1953, I'm sorry. And our daughter was born in 1957. And our second boy is in Russia right now taking a cruise. So the two boys lived with y'all in the barracks there? Yes. yes. So you had two babies, no fan, no TV, <laughs> no air. No car. No. no car. No, we had a car then. No. When we moved back, we had a car. Uh, we, okay. So you were busy with those kids. Right. And where did y'all move after you lived in the barracks? Oh, don't ask her. Oh, we Another moved place? into, oh yes. <laughs> there was there was a, a dorm called Ward Hall, a big old frame house that they put in behind Beretta down in there. And uh, some of the athletes lived there. And we moved in there. Ms. Ward was still living there. 
and her sister lived with her. She was an elderly woman at the time. But we lived there. Then we moved to Pleasant Street. Uh, Pleasant Street is now, you, uh, what is that? Sesame Drive, I think. Oh, yeah. oh, right. Sesame That's Drive. Right. And it was called Pleasant Street. Yes. Yeah. It just doesn't much of it. Into a house while they were they were building the new dorm and we were going to move in the the new DR dorm and new gym there. Did the and university pay your bo your rent? Yeah, yeah. they just yeah. let us. They lived there as we lived there as dorm directors. You okay. know, and uh, they didn't pay us any salary though, did they? Come but, to think but, of it, to live, but they let no, us no, live there. Coach Josh convinced me that they didn't need to pay me any raise because look, you get to stay free in that house. I, I told my wife, and I thought. <laughs> but Dolores had to work too as the dorm I guess mother. So. Yes, but no. there weren't any trouble. We didn't have any problems. <laughs> so your kids kind of grew up on campus. Yes. Well, and then when they moved the, uh, built the new gym, the athletes' dorms were upstairs, so we literally lived in the gym, in the dorm, when our children were babies. But we needed to get out of there right <laughs> pretty quick. I, I got tired of that pretty quick. They had no place to play, you know, so. We moved out to Smith Lane into a house that we were in. Then we moved, do you want to know all this? We moved what up on Highland Drive. That was a new addition that had opened up behind the college then, in a house on the corner of Highland Drive and Holland Street, I it was. And we lived there till 1964, I think it was, and we built a house up on where we live now on Spring Lake Hill. So you've seen lots of change. You've seen the university completely oh, change. Yeah. Completely. Yeah, completely. Since you started there. You started there like in 1954? I've been trying to figure out. <clears throat> Graduated from college and then went to Eagle Pass. So 1953, I guess. Or 54. Yes, we came back in 1953. In the fall of 1953. And so the university has gone to now 30, over 30,000 students. and From 1,700 to 30,000. So it, you've probably seen a lot of changes in the athletics. It sounds like you were the head coach, the janitor, the, I mean, you did all the recruit. <laughs> now they have recruiters. And oh, hush, that makes me plumb mad. You had nobody, you did no, it all. That's right, that's right, exactly right. That's exactly right. <clears throat> I got two or three more things I want to talk about. Good, please. We had some other people came back to Southwest Texas, except Lyndon, besides Lyndon Johnson. We had a guy one time who came to Emmy's Auditorium in 57, 58, his name was Elvis Presley. And he was so well known, we didn't even go to hear him. We didn't know who that we didn't was. We Elvis Presley was. He was he just, was just starting his career. Away. That's right, and it's right back. That's right. And then B.J. Thomas, you ever hear that guy? He was on TV <clears throat> one night with a, with a song, Raindrops Are Falling. And the next, he flew to San Marcos, and the next day he was in my gym singing Raindrops Are Falling at, at, at our gym. That's a true story, too. Uh, also, a guy, you probably never heard of him, but Tommy Darcy brought his band down there to the girls' gym. We had a big dancer, and my wife and me danced. That's right. There were a lot of dances in, in uh, the girls' gym during that time. There was an old, it's not the girls' gym now, you know, I mean, it's old. They've torn it down, I believe. Yeah. I'm, I got one more thing to tell you, y'all don't want to hear it. Do we want to hear it. We do want to hear it. <clears throat> San Marcos had a boy one, <clears throat> one time named Lucius Jackson. Lucius Jackson. No. When he was about uh, maybe the eighth grade, maybe the ninth grade, I saw him do a flip and a half in Sewer Park off the diving board. <clears throat> he was about six foot five, a dark black guy. Great looking athlete. I got talking with him. We talked, we talked, we talked. He wanted to play, he wanted to go to Marcus High School and play basketball. They weren't integrated. They did everything on the sun. They weren't integrated. What are you going to do? So he moved himself, or his family moved him to Louisiana and he lived with his kinfolk, graduated in Louisiana. When he got through graduating, he came back to my gym and said, Coach, can I play for you? We went to the president or everybody and said, can we get him in school? We're not integrated. This guy is a great basketball what player. What year was this? Roughly. I really don't know. Was, the 60s by then? Yes, but before that. 
anyway, he says, Coach, I want to play for you. And I can't do it. So he went to Pan America. You know where that is? Way down the valley. They won the, they won the national championship, and he was the most valuable player. That ain't all of it. That's a San Marcos boy. Wait a minute. Uh, after he graduated, I saw him again. Now he's six eight, weighs about two hundred and forty pounds. Uh, we were not. He was drafted by the Philadelphia Warriors in the professional league. He played on the South on the United States Olympic team that they won it. He was the most valuable player at the Olympics. This same guy that was from San Marcos, we couldn't get him in school. He was all pro. Later, he told me he had three things he wanted to do with life and didn't get to do any of them. Number one, he wanted to play for the San Marcos Rattlers. Number two, he wanted to play for me. And number three, he wanted to play for the Boston Celtics, and they didn't draft him. Because of his race? No, no, no. 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 But, you know, it just when it's time to draft, somebody already But that's why him. he didn't play for San Marcos that's exactly, and South exactly, That's right. Yeah, that's, that's Had exactly. he been given those opportunities, he might have been drafted. Oh, he was drafted because he went to what we went to Philadelphia and made, made a fortune up there. But he could have played for me, and I'd have been up. I wouldn't have been talking to you. I'd have been there. I'd have been somewhere else. <laughs> well, you probably had some really good players come through there that over the I years. I had some good players. I had a boy named Trump. Yeah, I had a bunch of players. Black, white, every color, and rainbow. One of my best ones was a Mexican boy named Henry Garcia, little old Mexican boy from Houston. I had, I had some black boys good too. I got them all. They all I go to a basketball game, they'll come back and see the bucket. <laughs> they'll be four or five, and they'll kiss me on top of my head. I said, oh, oh, God told me one thing, what you got on top of your head? I said, I ain't got any hair. I guess I don't know what it is. But anyway, it, I'm sorry, ma'am. You shouldn't have asked my wife to come up here. About your wife? <laughs> yeah, you know, you got, you know, got me up here. I wasn't talking. <laughs> Tell me some more stories, some more things you remember about all these years in San Marcos. I know you have more in there. When I was coaching football, I had to do the scouting too. You did football too? Uh, yeah, I had to scout. Well, ma'am. I thought uh, you just did basketball and lifeguarding. <laughs> when did you, who did you coach football for? Tech Southwest? Well, I, my word, I never worked there was up here. What do you mean? So, so of course I would play coach football. Coach football here. So when it wasn't basketball season, you had to work football? That's right. With the, football would start. And when basketball was starting, Coach Jair says, McDonald, you go take the basketball team tonight and I'll coach football the rest of the day. So I'd coach, I'd coach football for an hour, hour and a half and then I'd truck off up to the gym and take the basketball players and they hit, hit to the football team. That's all the coaches we had. I was over by myself with all these crazy wild Indians and he'd down there with a, with a football player. That's right. I'll tell you what kind of guy I coached. He also with. taught classes. I taught a full load for every year I coached at Southwest Texas, I taught, a, I taught a full load summer, winter, and fall. What did you teach? Everything they had. I taught statistics, which acts like an idiot. I wasn't that smart. I copied. I, caught, I taught first aid. A lot of times I taught first aid, but I taught bowling. I taught canoeing, holding hand, canoeing, canoeing everything, As everything. <laughs> uh, they made me, did you go with me down so I take uh, learn how to do canoeing? Yeah, down at uh, aquatic school. Yeah. yeah, aquatic school. Yeah. That was years later, though. I mean, you know. But you were still the head foot basketball but, yeah, coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I, I was, Slash everything else. Yeah. Yes. 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 Times have really changed. In the coaching profession. And you didn't have it. You didn't get. Did you have a six-figure salary? Was it <laughs> like, like From, zeros it, behind your? number in front of that number mine were mine were, <laughs> I had a bunch of zeros and there were zeros in front of it wasn't much left to that <laughs> oh god ma'am you're gonna ruin your whole story I'm sorry I no, can't this is great no it's not it's okay. great <laughs> it, it shows how times have really oh really, really. My things word. were simpler back then I mean oh yeah yeah. That's unbelievable that he came in and said, you want to be the head coach and gave you the keys. No, that's not the junior high, that's the college, that's the university, you, you hit. The reason it happened, I'll tell you that part too. In 1961, 60 we won a national championship in basketball. The football team was 0 and 11. We couldn't beat a rug. And Dr. Flyers called him in after he got back in and said, 
Jared, I want you to be the football coach. He said, I don't want to be a football coach. He said, I want you to be the football coach. Now think about it. And the coach said, well, okay, I'll think about it. So he thought about it to the day. And he came back to Dr. Flowers. He said, I got three things I want you to do. And if you do it, I'll be your football coach. He said, what's that? He said, number one, when I quit, I want to be the athletic director. I'm not coaching nothing. Dr. Flowers said, okay, you got it. He said, number two, McDonald's basketball coach. He said, you got it. That's it. You got it. That's how I got it. I can remember the third thing, what it was. Number three was something else. Anyway. Co- <laughs> no, yeah. no money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're not part of that. Now, clear. Uh, yeah, he, he's trying to be able to tell me what to say. <laughs> I, would, I would tell you my salary, but I'm embarrassed. What's that ring you wear? Is that a championship ring? Yeah, in ring? 1960, our basketball team won a national championship. I was assistant coach to Coach Jowers. Boy, we were good. We were good. We beat Baylor in Waco. We beat a and at College Station. We beat Texas Tech in Lubbock. We beat them all. Wow. We beat them all. Oh, because of Coach Jowers. Not one of our players, not one of our players had a scholarship anywhere except here. Nobody wanted us. Nobody wanted us. And we beat them all. That, that did such a power. We beat them all. But go to Coach Jowers. That guy was bad boy. I'm going to tell you another story. I heard you were pretty good, too. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to tell you another story about Coach Jowers. He had cancer of everything. I mean, he was just, but he was at it's M.D. Anderson. And we played a game on Friday and Saturday night and lost them both. Real close, but we lost them both. And I came in, I said, Lord, I, I need to go see Coach Jarrett. I don't know he's going to die. She said, well, not now. He's said, now. So I got in the car and drove to Houston after a ball. I must have got there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And got to the hospital, and Miss Jarrett was sitting in the door of, of Coach Jarrett's room. And I said, Miss Jarrett, can I see Coach? And she turned around, she was melting, McDonald wants to see you. And he said, come in, kind of funny. And I looked there, and his tongue was black and out of his mouth. Oh, poor guy, poor guy. And why I said this, I said, Coach Judge, what can I do for you? He said, you can't do one thing for me. You own two. What can I do for you? I cried. <laughs> he knew we lost. <laughs> you own two. He said, I said, oh, that guy was bad, bad dude. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh he was <laughs> He was really something. Wasn't he something, Lord? <laughs> wow. He had a house out on yeah, I'm sorry. He had a house out on the Blanco River. Flood came in one time. He said, McDonald, I got a I got a pump about halfway down the bank down there. I want you to help me get that pump out of the flood is gonna get it. I said, What do you mean? He said, Just come with me. So I got me I got in the car and he went out there. He had a long rope and he wrapped it around his stomach about four times. And he started to climb down to the chimney. He said, Wait a minute, wrap it around your stomach. I said, why? He said, if I fall, you're coming after me, buddy. I wrapped that thing and I said, he climbed down and got that, got that pump and brought it up there. I was scared to death. If he had a fall, I was going to have to go over that bank and that water. It was flood water down there. If I go in, you better be right after me. I got it. <coughs> he was the baddest guy in town. He sounds like He was the baddest guy in town. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That hadn't got a thing to do with Yeah, it does. Those are great stories. Those are fantastic stories. Go ahead, look. What? You got something Well, I was just telling about the, the uh, downtown around the square. Uh-huh. The buildings are the, look the same. They may be different, painted different things, different colors. And they were different. Uh, Nettie Sarur and, and Dempsey had a clothing store, men's on one side and women's on the other. There were four drugstores I counted around the square, and most of them had soda fountains. The, the high school students and the college students hung out a lot in Miller's Drug over, on the, over behind the old State Bank building. Uh-huh. It's, the State Bank building is still there. And it had a beautiful post office. I don't know why they ever got rid of that. It was, it was up, you had to go up some stairs. It had some columns. It was just a beautiful building, and they tore it down. And I, that's where Sprawl's Bank is now, I think. Um, what else did we do? Oh, Julia's Tea Room was on oh. West San Antonio Street. Julia Posey uh, had it. She was a local uh, uh, artist, but she had this tea room. And some of the 
literary societies, we didn't have uh, we didn't have sororities then, but literary societies would have parties there, like at Christmas time or something. That was fun, and uh, I think Junior Posey's daughter still lives here, Kay. She does. Yes. Well, you've seen it all. We're running out of time. Can you just give me a little bit of a summary of your years in San Marcos? San Marcos has been y'all been good to San Marcos. Sounds like San Marcos has been it good has to y'all. I well, never. We live in the best part of San Marcos. We live in up, up on kind of up on a hill on Mimosa Circle right up oh, in yeah. there. We kind of leave town and then all of a sudden we're back in town. I never thought when I came here in 1948 I'd spend the rest of my life here, but I certainly am glad I did. It's been a good town to live in and to raise children. And 65 years with that guy over there, boy. <laughs> You're a saint. It's been good and it's been bad. <laughs> hey, who's doing? Hey, I speak, did see hey, lots speak of ball back there. Hey, speak that guy back there. <laughs> how about you, Vernon? How how about you reflecting on these years in San Marcos? It was hard on my wife. It was hard on my wife. You worked all the time, it sounds like. But so many times, so many times I had to take my car. We would take a college car and my car to go on a road trip. We they didn't have a bus, I guess. No. A bus? We'd leave on Monday, we'd play two games. We'd leave on Monday, we'd play on Tuesday somewhere, we'd travel on, I mean, uh, uh, we'd leave on Friday, we'd play on Saturday, and, and we'd travel on Sunday and, and play on Monday to play two games. I had our one car, and she's home with 17 kids and dirty clothes, and, <laughs> and she's walking to, you didn't tell them that, well, oh. and she walked to... Water. That was before we had children. I, I, the first, uh, in 1950, 52, I graduated in January, and I went to work at the San Marcos Academy. Academy, Baptist Academy, which is the West Campus now of mm -hmm. Texas State. And and we didn't have a car then, and I did walk. I walked up through the camp, uh, Southwest Texas and over to the Academy oh, to my awful. job. What was your job? They had a little store on campus, and I ran that little store for uh, one semester. We tried to work for them, and they wouldn't hire us. Who? <laughs> Play over there. For Stokes? We're just blaming somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and so y'all had three kids and your kids were all raised here in San Marcos. That's right. Went to graduated from San Marcos I two and Texas State. All three. All three. Our second son graduated. He was a good basketball player. He played point guard for me for four years. He was all conference. It's a, he, he was a pretty good basketball player. That was hard. That was hard on me and hard on him. You know, you know, coach's kids. It's, it's a hard, both ways hard. That's right. I had a guy come to me one time and said, "You're not fair to your boy." And I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, it, "He'll do things and go take him out." You're hard that's, on your boy. That's right. Somebody will do the same thing. You don't say the thing to him. Like, well, he's got to be a little different. He was on a half scholarship too, and in the last two years, I put him on full, and he came in and he said, "Dad, if you had to give me a full scholarship, I just won't quit." And I said, "No, you weren't. Yeah, I was too." Said everybody had four scholarships except me. I said, well, you got one now. <laughs> oh, it's great life. It's great life. Dad Burns, great life. You know what she's best at? She says, cut that off. Nurse. She's got me just sick as a horse the last year, and she just waits on me hand and foot. She seems like you, you, you said you weren't very smart, but I think you got you a good wife, Vernon. I Beth. think you, I you I think you were kind of. I Beth. think you were kind of smart in the marriage department. Oh, no doubt. She wasn't. She wasn't. I mean, it's just, no, that's right. Am I telling the truth? Am I sick? Or, ma'am, I went to this hospital. You can't tell that. Don't tell that. No. <laughs> Get that off camera. Okay, we're about to finish up. Any final <laughs> thoughts? Sure has been interesting. She really I'm shows. Sorry. It shows how much things have changed. Oh, yes. And the town you live in doesn't, and the university doesn't even resemble. No. No. What y'all came no. to? That's true. No. I mean, it's totally different than where y'all first came. Except the square is just about the same, you know. This and there are stores all around the square. Well, thank you so much. Oh, it's I wanted to tell you okay. about Walling's okay. Creamery. Okay. I almost forgot that. You did. You did. Walling's Creamery was down on. Uh, Too late. University, University Drive, uh -huh. about where Colloquium is now. But it was up on the street, you know, there, and there was nothing behind it, and they had an ice cream parlor there, too. And some of the college boys worked down there. This was before I knew Vernon. 
some of the college boys were down there, so we would go down quite often and have an ice cream cone, and they'd put a little dollop of whipped cream on it for us. So we really enjoyed that. And we didn't have to worry about our weight because we were walking everywhere. We never rode anywhere, so we enjoyed Walling's Creamery. You through? Are you through? Yes, but I got one more after okay, it's over. Okay, one no, more. No, no, no. When you're through, one more after it's over. You got one more before it's over? After it's over. One time, one, one time, the football boys started screaming, yelling, ice cream on the second floor. That's Bob Kid, too. Ice cream on the second floor. And they came out, ice cream, and everybody was going to the second floor and eating ice cream. And Coach Jowers went upstairs and said, Yeah, where is that ice cream? And he went up to the second floor, and there they were getting it out with their hands. And about a 10 gallon thing. He says, Who got that? And this old boy said, Me and my roommate did, Coach. He says, where'd you get it? He says, I found it. <laughs> he says, where'd you find it? He says, back of Mr. Walling's creamery. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 he says, go take, go right down there and you said, tell him you stole it. Get a receipt, bring it back to me, or we're gonna start running. He says, yes, I'll do it. So he went down there and he got a receipt book and filled it out and signed himself, brought it back to Coach Jarrett and everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> now that's not supposed to be on, but that, Great story. Well, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I'm Thanks sorry. for sharing your stories. We could go on running out of tape, I'm afraid. Right? We love <laughs> <laughs> She's ready to leave. I know five it is. Oh, he said we have five more minutes. So oh. I, got, I know you got five more minutes worth of stories in you. I just hate to miss anything. One time, Dolores went with me to scout. I was going to scout Soil Ross in football. Went out there and their press box was about like the room she's sitting in. And I went out and I pecked on the door and I said, I'm Vernon McDonald from Southwest Texas. Where do I sit? And they said, We don't have room for you. And I said, Well, it looks like it's going to rain. He said, We don't have room for you. I'm sorry, Mr. McDonald, but you. I said, What well, about the time it started raining? And uh, can I come in there? And they said, Well, any people were just standing up for it, well, about like that. No, you can't come here. So I go back down and I get in my car with my wife and I pull it down on the track at So Ross. I pull around to the end of it and I pull off the track between the goalposts, the goalposts. I turn the headlights on and the windshield wiper. <laughs> and we, we just got that game. I said, what happened? She said, well, I think that guy on the left end. So I'm writing this stuff down from, from the, the rain just pouring down. <laughs> Dad burned. And now, now, see, I'm getting real mad about that. <laughs> now. And it could see, I So you it. had to scout football, too. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. And I'd go back after the game, and I'd meet the coaches at 8 o'clock next morning and tell them what they did the night before. I drove all night, and I'd set up the they rest of the night. They wouldn't pay for a hotel room for you? What? <laughs> I guess you didn't get a gas mileage reimbursement, either. Oh, yeah. seven cents a mile. Yes, ma'am. You did. Yes, ma'am. That's another story. Okay. I had a boy named Bill Kruger who's well known everybody in Texas. He's a great, great coach down at Clear Lake. He played basketball for me. We kept going out to Soul Ross and, and, and he had a little money. He was from he was from Johnson City. He said, Coach, let me take my car out there at seven cents a mile. I said, Can I take can I, let me take my car? And I, he kept on bugging me several for several, several times. So I said, Okay, this next week week you can take your car. So he loaded up and away we went to Soul Ross. We went All to Soul full Ross. of basketball players and the coach packed right. in there. Uh, no, no, we had two cars, but it was his car and my car. But they were both full. Oh, both packed. Oh, yes, ma'am. And we went right out there, about three fourths we were out there, pow, pow, he had a blowout. <laughs> Changed the tire and coming back, he went, pow, he had another blowout, two blowouts. Had seven cents a mile, didn't even buy a new tire. He came to me and he says, Coach, I ain't taking my car anymore. <laughs> Bill Kruger was a high school basketball coach. That's a true, later. That's a true story. Too. He didn't take his car anymore. He's back. And one state, didn't Bill Kruger? Oh, win? twice. Oh, he great. And he coach. was well, one of the players. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he coached the San Marcos. He uh, who, Bill who were some of the players on the team? Then do you remember? No, a bunch of white boys. It was he had all white boys. You want to have one state? You have kids that uh, that played for you that come around and and come look you up all the time. <laughs> I would guess so. All and that, it, all that. Yes, yeah, yeah, I got the good. I got some guys that didn't even play for me to come around and look me up. I got from Chicago as a policeman. Played for the net, the basketball coach after yeah, him. Yeah, he, he didn't like him, he liked me. I don't know why. 
Yes, it's a great life. It seems Coaching is a great life if you're not married, but most of them are married. So you like figure that. you've been to a lot of games to Lawrence? Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Oh. My boys played ball, uh, little league ball. And he was always and working, so you were at the games. Well, he coached the little league team in the he summer. Did. <laughs> yeah, did in he did. Did you ever sleep? Don't sleep now. I'm just on my mind. Got... <laughs> so he knew lots of kids. Do you remember any of the school boys that played little league for you? And we had a boy named Ed Tisdale was the best one I've ever seen. He had home runs and nothing bad. You know, you remember the Tisdale? Anyway, he wasn't worth it. Well. But I had a rule. But, you know, you go, when you're a coach, you got to have rules. I had a rule if we practiced on on Monday, we played on Tuesday, and we practiced on Thursday, and we played on Friday. If you miss practice, you don't play. You just, it's a rule, and, I do, and they all understood it. Their parents understood it. One day, a little boy, my shortstop, my best parent came to the game, had his uniform on, just cried. I said, what are you crying about? I said, you're not going to play tonight because you missed practice. He said, I know. Oh, he cried, he cried, he cried. I, I got mad at him. I said, did you know you weren't going to get to play? And she said, yes, sir, I did. After about two minutes, I said, why are you crying? He said, my mother shot herself and I've been in the hospital. I said, boy, get out there and play show. <laughs> Can you believe it? I wouldn't let him play because his mama shot herself. <laughs> boy, I was a tough coach. I really was. <laughs> Don't put that in the That's a true story, too, Dad. Burr. That boy cried, cried, cried. He goes, his mama's about to die. I said, you're not going to play ball. You must practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he said, that's it. That's it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said well, that. Well, this has been it. fun. I, I, we had a, this was better than what we were going to do. So. Well, you're telling your real life stories. And most of them are true, you said, right? <laughs> I, th I have a feeling Dolores would correct you if you got it wrong. I would. I surely would. <laughs> You've done that once or twice in 65 years? Once or twice. He, and now he's very forgetful. I have to remind him of lots of things. <laughs> she didn't treat me good a lot of times. I don't know about this marriage. I don't know where it on. <laughs> I've been looking at girls lately. <laughs> <laughs> Have they been looking back? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Hey, 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 That's hey, the get, question. Get, get. I had to get one word hey, in. <laughs> hey, get, hey, hey, you get back there and get that camera going. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Sure, it, I, I, it. I wish I had 10 hours to listen to you. We had a, we had a great life. We had a, we've had been poor, but we had a great life. We ain't poor anymore. Seems like <laughs> you're rich, really, with memories and, and experiences. This has been easier than we thought, wasn't it? We were yeah. kind of uptight, you know, but you made us relax. He was uptight? George <laughs> was uptight. She was uptight. She, she didn't want to, she taught school all of her life. And I said, no, you know, you'll be good. She oh, taught. you work outside the home too? Oh, yeah. She taught school for 400 years. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. <laughs> Break it out again. Where did you teach? I, well, I started teaching at Navarro High School. I majored uh -huh. in English and taught out there. And I taught the 8th grade through the 12th grade English and speech and I had the annual, had to do the annual, had to do the one act play, I had a little newspaper we did and then I started out there six years and then I got, I taught one year at the academy and I, in the meantime I was working on my master's degree and I got it in elementary education so I started teaching at Travis in San Marcos after that. Forever. forever. Right, and raised three kids and married to a coach. <laughs> right. Wow. You you make it so, you make me feel no, I don't know how I did it now. <laughs> I don't know how y'all did it. I wow. Either. I don't either. I don't know. Seems like y'all did a good job. It was it was nothing tough, but uh, <laughs> we made it. Are we through? Oh you mean you you're just gonna let us go on and on? <laughs> Nine minutes left on the Oh, no. Oh, no. You said that. If you're, if you're done. He usually cuts everybody off. He's he's really enjoying the McDonald's. We're usually I usually get cut, tapped on the shoulder, but I think he's really enjoying y'all. Well, we've enjoyed doing it, haven't we? I've been waiting for a, a wrap-up. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps... <laughs> he, he's got lots of stories. I wrote a book here about... 
When did I write that book? Oh, about five years ago, I guess now. What's the name of the book? Playing for a, for a winner and remembering Coach Jowers. Is that the, at the library? Yes. It's at the university library, I don't know. Yes. Playing for a winner and remembering Coach Jowers. It's all about Coach Jowers and a little bit about me, but a lot, a lot of the of players. The, a lot of the old players wrote in anecdotes that he compiled I, I, and put wrote, I put up 500, I copied and sold them all. Pow! Sold them all, just squeezed it. Yeah, it was good stories. You like it, like good stories. For instance, we played Saul Ross in football, Coach Jowers football coach. We had an old boy who played linebacker, and he tackled the guy and knocked himself cold as a wedge. Cold as a wedge, and he just laid out there. And he couldn't get him to come to, and so they, they, they called the doctors to come, come down and check on this old boy. He, he came down and looked at him, and he took a bite and put it into his eye. And he says, no reaction, no reaction. Coach Jarrett says, that's a glass eye, try the other one. He's oh, <laughs> That's honest truth. He was trying to get that glass eye, and it wouldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> he, he remembers the strangest thing. <laughs> That's a true story too. I ain't joking to you. Did well, you they ever... didn't. You didn't coddle the athletes back then like they no, coddle it. No, no, no. no. Did, did you, you do? Ever... Did you give licks and stuff? Did they do the the punishment? How did you punish your players? Run the lear up, run them to death. One time we had a boy named Chuck Trucker that made a wasn't, wasn't working good in basketball. And coach Jarrett was the head coach, and he said, "Just start running. I'll tell you when to quit." And he ran and he ran and he ran and we went into the shower and took a shower. Both of us did. And he went home and so did I. And he got home and he says, I forgot to tell that boy to stop. So he, he lived out on the blank old river. He, he came down and he was going, that boy wasn't running, but he was walking slow. So he was still out there. He said, well, I changed my mind. He forgot about it. So he said, like, that's all enough, Chuck. I'll change my mind. You can quit now. Hey, he lied like a dog. He didn't change his mind. He forgot about it. It was nighttime? Oh, of course it was nighttime. The boy was just barely moving. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. You ain't waiting on me, babe. I didn't want to come in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> you want my notes? <laughs> All right.